Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. Uh, this is Science for the Public. I'm Yvonne Stapp, and welcome tonight to uh, Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, Richard Premack is a professor of biology at Boston University. He received his PhD from Duke University in 1976 and has since built a long and distinguished academic career which is comprehensive in scope. For example, plant populations and rare plant species, tropical forest ecology and conservation, the loss of species in protected areas, and biological impacts of climate change, our particular focus tonight. Dr. Premack has served as a visiting professor at the University of Hong Kong and at Tokyo University, and he's been awarded Bullard and Putnam Fellowships from Harvard University and a Guggenheim Fellowship also. He was president of the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation and is currently editor-in-chief of the journal Biological Conservation. Some more than 27 foreign language editions of his textbooks have been produced with uh, something quite unique, local co-authors adding in local examples, which he'll talk about tonight. He's an author of rainforest books also, and he's currently writing a popular book about changes in Concord, Massachusetts since the time of Henry David Thoreau and Walden. Dr. Premack's distinctions are very extensive. We therefore refer you to his page on the Science for the Public website for additional information. And meanwhile, we are very honored to welcome Professor Richard Premack. Welcome, sir. Hey, thank you for having me. Yes. And I'd like to start off with a little bit of general background. You went uh, you've been all over the globe and seen climate change. Could you say when you noticed a real distinction and is there any region that you would cite as particularly affected? Well, in order to detect the fingerprint of climate change, the, one of the best ways of doing it is to find historical records of when things happened in the past, the timing of past events, which is what we call phenology in this area of research. And it turns out that the Boston area is uniquely suited to this kind of work because we have such a rich heritage of naturalists and scientific institutes and colleges and universities in this area. So we started looking for this information in 2003. And as soon as we started looking, we started finding the evidence of climate change. So at this point, actually, the Boston area <laughs> is probably as well documented as any area um, in the United States and is one of the best areas also in the world for climate change research. That's quite interesting. I don't think we're aware that we, we think that we're out there in front all the time anyway in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. well, but we really here we are at climate really change. Are here here we are at climate change, exactly. In your work with looking at, at uh, uh, climate change, but also ecosystems, which I'd like you to explain, if you would, to us uh, a little bit, you have emphasized, and again, it seems quite uniquely, individuality of some of these ecosystems that the rest of us kind of merge together, like tropical rainforests or something. Could you give us a little explanation of ecosystem and then this individuality that you worked on? Okay, well up until about 20 years ago, people mostly talked about biological communities. So all the plants and the animals and the fungi living together in one place were called the biological community. But now people often use this term ecosystem to mean also the chemical and physical mm -hmm. interactions of that biological community. So how the biological community absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, how it translates sunlight and water into producing new plant tissue, and also how it traps rainwater and then gradually releases it as pure water into our rivers and lakes. 
So all these kind of more encompassing processes of mm -hmm. a biological community we now call an ecosystem. So it's a bit more of a comprehensive terminology and also emphasizes the role that these ecosystems play in sort of human affairs. And so we have worked on tropical ecosystems, particularly in Malaysia on the island of mm -hmm. Borneo, but then beginning around nine years ago, my students and I decided to focus on the Boston area, so on our forests and fields mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in the Boston area to see if we could see the effects of climate change on the ecosystems of this particular region. And? What did we find? Yeah. So as, again, as, as soon as we started looking, uh, there are lots of different potential effects of climate change on biological communities or ecosystems. Mm -hmm. and. The ones that we're most concerned about probably are things like the loss of species, so mm -hmm, th how mm -hmm, rare mm -hmm. and endangered species decline because of warming temperatures and drier conditions in the summertime. We might be concerned with forest health, so mm -hmm, for example, mm -hmm. if the t conditions get warmer and there's outbreaks of insects, how this will cause our forests to start dying, resulting in loss of timber and mm -hmm. loss of water quality in this region. But of all, but of all these characteristics of ecosystems, the one that we can actually detect the first is on the timing of events. So all these other events are linked together, mm. but the first one that we will actually see the effects of for climate change is the timing of when plants flower and when they leaf out, or when birds start migrating in the spring, mm. or when butterflies start flying. And so we've really focused on these timing events, and we found lots of evidence. Whenever we've looked, we have always found the evidence of timing. And the effects of timing is strongest in the case of plants. So plants oh. are very, very responsive to temperature. So plants are now flowering about, flowering and leafing out anywhere from 10 days to two weeks earlier than in Thoreau's times. And birds are also changing as well, but probably only on the order of a couple of days earlier since Thoreau's times. And insects are really the, still the unknown of this subject mm. area. We really. For a long time, we thought that there was actually no insect data out there. We were searching intensively for information about insects, and we thought that nobody had really been following insects very closely. And only in the last like one or two years, we've started to discover bodies of data about insects, and that's really a very intensive area of investigation right now. And there, that may account for why there is some substantial damage uh, with uh, trees in various parts of the country and so forth, too, because of the warmer climate or That's right. whatever. So, so, right. so insects are very strongly controlling plant populations in many uh -huh. areas of the country. And so as conditions get a little bit warmer, a lot of insects, instead of dying off during the winter, wind up surviving either completely or just better, and that results in insect outbreaks. This is a very big problem with uh, mm. beetles in yes. the western United States. They're killing huge areas of pine trees. Right. And, in the, and in the Massachusetts or the New England area, warmer temperatures really facilitate the uh, development of this one particular insect called the woolly adelgid, mm. which is really attacking the uh, hemlock trees in this area very strongly. But that's true of a lot of other insects as well, which are forest pests. That as conditions get warmer, we're going to be expecting more pest outbreaks and damage to trees. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Can I take you back just for a minute and ask you about the individual systems, uh, ecosystems that you had focused on in, in the past? Do you mind if I just shift you a little bit sure, to fine. the tropical work a little bit, which we don't really hear a whole lot about, and we're going to spend some time on the Massachusetts thing uh, shortly. But could I just ask about that, the individuality of these systems, um, uh, like the tropical rainforest systems? Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, Boston, again, has a very unique role to play because in most areas of the United States, when people talk about the tropical rainforest, they're mostly talking about rainforests in the Americas, either the Caribbean mm -hmm. or Central America or Brazil. But in the Boston area, Boston has always had this interesting focus on a more international perspective and also particularly a focus on, on Asia. There's been a long mm -hmm. association of Boston with um, Asian interests. And in the Boston area, many of the, the tropical biologists in the Boston area work in Asia, work in India or Malaysia, Indonesia, or oh. other countries. And so as a result, when I started working in Malaysia, I was constantly reacting to biologists from elsewhere in the United States who were talking about the tropical rainforest, because the rainforests in Southeast Asia are not like the forests in the American tropics. Mm -hmm. And so it made me thinking about how those forests in Asia are different from the Americas and also how they're different from rainforests in Africa and Madagascar. Mm -hmm. So I began to 
decide to develop this as a subject, mm -hmm. and I wound up writing a book with a colleague of mine, Richard Corlett, and we mm -hmm. wrote a book describing how rainforests in different parts of the world are actually totally different from the, one another. There isn't this one thing called the tropical rainforest. In fact, there are very different kinds of tropical forests on each continent, each one of which has its own unique characteristics. Can you give us an example of something unique about A or B? Oh, there, there's, there's so many examples, but mm -hmm. one example is that in the American tropics, there's fairly regular seasonality, so that plants flower and fruit on a fairly regular cycle, and the animals reproduce on a fairly regular annual cycle, depending on the cycles of drought and then mm -hmm. monsoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in Southeast Asia, where I worked, there, there's typically uh, rain almost all the time. It's almost always sort of rainy and hot and humid. And then once every five to seven years, there's a, there's a period of drought followed by a period of tremendous flowering and fruiting of the trees. So you don't have these annual cycles of flowering and fruiting. You, in fact, have these five to seven year cycles of or five, five years in which there's very little fruit and flowers in the forest and suddenly a, a super abundance of flowers and fruits. So it's a very different biology and it means that the animals there tend to be much larger in size because they have to be bigger to survive these long periods oh. with less food and they tend to reproduce on five to seven year cycles rather than every one year cycle. So it's a very, very different biology in, in the forest there. I can imagine insects adapting like that and so on. That's so right. they've so just all, been all the animals are adapted to this very, very different sort of cycle of, of, of production of flowers and fruits. Right. Just very quickly, you know that's like an El Nino cycle as well. Does that, that is, have anything? That oh, is it correct. is. It yeah, follows the, the El Nino. Nino. That's right. So it's uh, linked to the El Nino cycle. And, and the, all of these organisms apparently have learned to, or a lot of them, adapt yeah, they, they, or they, they don't. Have, they have evolved to adapt <laughs> yeah, to them. Otherwise that, that, they would have died out. That's quite interesting. As a biologist, could you say anything about relative fragility from one species to another? Do you know, is there some little gene out there that makes something more robust and adaptable? You probably observe this in your work, things that just right. aren't going to make it. That's right. So in the work which we've been doing in the Boston area on climate change, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the, the changes which are occurring in temperature and rainfall patterns are so rapid that species really have difficulty adapting evolutionarily. But what's happening is it's changing the species composition in this area. So what's happening is that we're seeing that a lot of the southern species, species which have more southern distribution, are tending to increase in the Boston area. And a lot of the cold adapted species of more northern distribution are tending to decline in abundance. Mm -hmm. And also invasive species mm. are increasing in, in abundance. So the warm conditions particularly favor a lot of things like purple loosestrife or garlic mustard, which are really more warm adapted species. And so what we're seeing in Concord and really throughout the Boston area is a shift toward also particularly a, a greater percentage of invasive species, non-native invasive species, and a decreased percentage of native species. Uh -oh. And the one, native, the one group of native species that are really increasing are these sort of more southern species. So the south is moving up here is what you're telling us. Oh. So what's happening <laughs> oh, is they're, they're, they're dying out here. Oh. So the, in the, it, like in the Boston areas, yeah. the populations of northern species are dying out. They're surviving further north of here. And at the northern end, end of the range, they're, they're sending their sort of propagules, their seeds and fruits in all directions. And the ones which go further north wind up establishing sort of new colonies. Yeah. And what we, we don't see southern species arriving here yet. What we're, what we're really seeing is that the southern species that are already here are increasing in abundance. And what we suspect will be happening in future decades or centuries is, say, species which are presently in southern Connecticut or, say, in, in yeah. northern Virginia or New Jersey might eventually start arriving here and start becoming more common in this area. Do you know, with as southern species move upward, then that will shift our climate here you know, dramatically, uh, I assume, is that going to have a dramatic effect? Well, the climate here is changing, but it's not changing because the species are moving here. It's mm -hmm. changing because we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So because yeah. as long as we keep putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases, the conditions are going to continue to get warmer. It's, going to, it's probably going to change the rainfall patterns. We're going to have rising sea level, which is yes, going to be flooding coastal areas, right. a lot of areas Boston. Of, <laughs> of Boston, that's right, the Fall River, yes. <laughs> or a lot of Cape Cod and the islands. Yes. So we're going to have right. these effects. And the plants and the animals and the fungi are all adapting to that. 
And to some extent, it'll be a sort of a positive feedback loop because as conditions get drier, then the forests are going to start dying. They're going to be more susceptible to fire, and that will cause even oh, more changes. Yes. So when a forest burns, then the ecosystem becomes even drier and then becomes even more susceptible to further fire and to more drought tolerant species. So we're going to have a lot of changes in coming decades. Again, the timing events is kind of, is not the most significant biological uh -huh. event, but that's the one we can detect. It also, people need to be aware of that because as people are seeing these sort of changes in the timing, the earlier timing of spring, that just tells them that climate change is a reality and these other serious consequences like rising sea level, yeah. um, heat waves in the summertime, those are going to follow behind. Okay. On that cheery note, tell us, if you will, um, is there anything, I think in Massachusetts, the level of consciousness I think is pretty high anyway, and people are uh, concerned and want to do the right thing. What could citizens do the most that would be the most helpful, do you think? Well, there's, there's two things you can do. One important thing to do is if, if you're worried about there being too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is just try to produce less to drive, drive less, use more public transportation, yeah, buy more fuel-efficient cars. You know, don't heat your house as warm in the wintertime. Don't use air conditioning as much in the summertime. But the other thing you can do is to pressure the political leaders because yes. we, can, we can only do so much as individuals. It, these these uh, changes in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere really have to be taken by national and even international and efforts. International, so we really right. need to be pressuring the politicians. At the present time, it seems that the American public is convinced of the reality of climate change and even wants the political leaders to do something, However. but the, the, the public <laughs> is not pressuring the public exactly. to actually do enough. Exactly. And the political leaders will only react when they're being pressured by the public. Okay, nobody leaves here tonight without writing a letter. So thank you for encouraging us to get out there and do the pressuring right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to shift now to your very interesting research interests, which are enormous. Mm -hmm. But could you give us a little background? The people can see that we have all of this production. This is just the textbooks that mm -hmm. he's produced. So I want to do two things to talk about your research interests, very interesting mm -hmm. background. And then we'll go to the textbook thing, which is very innovative. Okay if you would please. So uh, you have studied these ecosystems all over the world and so on. What's your favorite thing to study? Well, of course the most interesting thing for me is what's happening in Concord and Walden Pond. I sensed that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we, we actually started it nine years ago looking for whatever evidence we could find in the eastern Massachusetts area. We found a lot of very interesting examples, particularly at the Arnold Arboretum because they have a very rich record of historical information there. But within about six months of starting to look in 2003, we discovered that Thoreau had made very detailed oh, observations yes. of when plants flowered um, in Walden Pond and, and around Concord. And these records uh, were of over 300 plant species for when they flowered between 1851 and 1858. And that other naturalists in Concord have continued these kinds of observations that Thoreau had made. And these records were, again were accessible to us, um, some of which were at the Concord Public Library. Mm. And so what we started doing starting in 2004 was making our own very detailed observations of when plants flowered in Concord and by using these records that Thoreau started and other people continued mm -hmm. and then, then we sort of started again um, over the last um, eight years we found that plants in Concord are now flowering much earlier than in the past. So this is a great example because mm -hmm. as far as we know it's the longest running example of the timing of flowering anywhere in the United States. Oh, it so is. it's 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 the best example in terms of the number of species, well not the well the combination of the number of species and the length of time. And that it's also associated with Thoreau of and Walden. Course. So it creates a lot of interest because people know about Thoreau, they know about Walden Pond. And so it really connects climate change to a body of literature and a historical figure that people are already already know about. So it's a great example. 
yeah, that is a very good example. But I uh, learned, I guess, from your work that that uh, other people really carried on that task of watching these uh, progressions, these seasonal changes over a long time, and you had this first-rate primary resource mm -hmm. uh, to do this work. So that's that's really very interesting. Is there any other area that you have just really enjoyed doing? Has been especially interesting for you? Well, in other areas, is working at the Arnold Arboretum, because at the Arnold Arboretum, they have uh, an enormous resource there in terms of not only the living collection, they have over a thousand sort of uh, plants growing there, trees, shrubs, and vines, mm. but they also have an enormous museum collection where people have gone out and made museum specimens of the plants growing on the grounds of the Arboretum. And so using these museum specimens, you can actually see when plants flowered in the past. Oh. And what, what's so wonderful about that is that by re we've gone out there and recorded when all the plants are flowering and leafing out at the Arnold Arboretum. And so that's a wonderful experience. I love to, I don't like to just be one of these scientists that just stays in their office and sends out their students to do all the research. I like doing the work myself. Okay. So my students and I go out every spring and we record when the plants flower and leaf out at the Arboretum. But when we started to match these records of when plants are flowering and leafing out at the Arnold Arboretum now with when they flowered and leafed out in the past using these museum specimens, we found out that plants are also again flowering and leafing out much earlier than they did mm -hmm. 50 or 100 years ago. And what we, I still remember when we actually asked an undergraduate to sort of prepare a, a comparison of the historical specimens with the modern records. And she showed us this beautiful diagram showing that plants were now flowering much earlier than the past. And we thought she'd actually made a mistake because it showed so clearly mm -hmm. the effects of change over time and the fact that plants flower earlier in warmer years than in colder years. And so I just, I still remember that excitement when she showed us this diagram. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just on that uh, qu quickly, uh, in case there's anybody still around who doesn't, who resists climate change, and there are some out there somewhere beyond Massachusetts borders, but the, in, in, in that case, uh, that they would say, well, there have been these cycles throughout history, and there are these five to seven year cycles also, but do you have grounds for saying no this is definitely due to this unique climate change that we have caused when you well, look at these records well our research is really about just how warming temperature mm -hmm. affects the flowering time of plants and mm -hmm. the migration of birds and actually I should also to be really very clear about this that what we're seeing in the Boston area about one-third of the warming has been about a um, about a two to three degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature since Thoreau's time um, in the Boston area. About one third of that is caused by global warming, mm -hmm. and about one and two thirds of that is caused by urbanization. Mm. So th just when you urbanize an area, when you create more parking lots and buildings right. and roads and cut down right. the trees, it causes a lot of warming. So actually that makes Boston a great place to study climate right. change because it's had so much warming. But the reason that we know that, that that this present warming trend is caused by human activity is because if you actually, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this sort of organization of the leading scientists in the world, have actually calculated that the warming that we've experienced is beyond what the normal fluctuations of mm -hmm. the, the climate are due to natural processes. And if you actually include the effects of all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it very accurately predicts mm -hmm. the amount of warming that we've seen. So we're in a slight cooling right now because of the kind of the El Nino Southern Oscillation right. Cycle, uh, but within a couple of years it'll be even warmer. But mm -hmm. even still, this year is still an extraordinarily mm -hmm. warm year mm -hmm. by historical standards. Right. So, you know, again, the leading scientists in the world tell us that the amount of warming we've seen is caused by this, this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Right. Right, and then there's a question of whether this is past some tipping point or whatever, but we won't go there for okay. the moment. Instead, we'll shift to your wonderful project, your textbook project. Now, you've been a prolific writer, mm -hmm. a prolific researcher, very comprehensive, and it's, it is quite unique. In academe, a lot of people get extremely narrow. You've gone the other way. So mm -hmm. you, it's a real gift to, say, students of biology, but I'd like to talk about some specific feature of your textbook. So your textbooks, a, a number of these, uh, well, two or three of these are standard textbooks for conservation mm -hmm. biology. And then 
in addition to that, you went another step. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us about this textbook project? Okay. So in 1992 and 1993, I wrote this book, which is The Essentials of Conservation Biology. And after it came out, I thought it would be translated into lots of different languages. And it was translated very quickly into Chinese and German. But that was all, and I wondered why it wasn't being translated to other languages. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that people in other countries didn't know what conservation biology was mm -hmm. because it's a relatively new field of biology. Mm -hmm. So I got this idea that instead of just waiting for foreign language publishers to approach my publisher and sort of suggest that maybe they would translate the book, what I would do is I would very actively seek out scientists from other countries, other languages, mm -hmm. and I would invite them to translate the book and to put in examples from their own country so the book mm -hmm. would really be very suited to the local mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. or audience in that country and that also that person by putting in all that local content would become a co-author. Actually a secret also is that, that this person would also become an advocate. So this person not only would be the co-author but by having a local co-author in the country they would advance the field of conservation biology that or nature sly. protection yes, okay. within the country. <laughs> so as one example, yeah. uh, in I kept waiting for a French edition of my textbook but it didn't appear. Mm -hmm. So I started just writing to French ecologists and conservation biologists inviting them to work with me to produce a French edition and eventually they put me in touch with two scientists at the University of Paris mm. who teach a large course in conservation biology in the Paris area. And when I proposed to them the idea of doing this book, they were wildly enthusiastic. And so this book just came out a couple of weeks ago. It's the latest book. It's the 28th book. Oh. Um, and so uh, this is really, you know, makes me quite happy. I think. So it has a lot of French content in it, examples from, you know, France and former French colonies. Um, lots of nice color that's pictures. That's interesting, that's right. yes. That's very interesting. Good. What other languages and so on? And I want to point out to people, this is, this is really extraordinary to go to this trouble to uh, uh, invite other authors from other countries and to look at uh, flora and fauna at that local level. It's, okay. I don't think there is any other a textbook out there and this no, great big field. I keep, I keep telling people about right, this idea. I right, keep but it's a great idea. It. So this one right here, this is the Czech edition, has a very beautiful cover. And so I was at a meeting of the International Congress of Ecology about uh, 10 years ago and there was this sort of shy man off by himself, uh, didn't seem to have many friends and so I went and talked Aww. to him just to be kind of kind, <laughs> discovered that he was one of the very few Czech scientists at this meeting. And so after talking with him for a while, I suggested, why doesn't he translate my book into the Czech language? And so he and a colleague of his translated the book into the Czech language and put in examples from the Czech Republic. And it's been great. I visited him a number of times in uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, we've actually gone on book tours around the Czech oh, Republic. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, talking about it. Actually, the first time we showed up at a university, the professor there was very hesitant. He, he wasn't sure the students would really be interested in coming and hearing about this new field of conservation mm -hmm. biology. And in fact, we went and the audience was, the auditorium was packed. All the students voluntarily wanted to hear about conservation biology, and we sold out all the books that we brought with us. Oh, the this is were wonderful. Really, really hungry for conservation yes, biology. Yes, that's excellent. Anything else on that before we get into the the nature of conservation biology training? Then, okay. Well, again, yeah. his, his, this is the the Chinese edition. So, yeah. and um, notice that they're making them paperback and lighter. This is a load for your backpack. That's right. So that's been, that's so been a very big concern. So yeah. um, we, 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 we try to make these as, as inexpensive mm -hmm. as possible. So uh, again, it's very thin paper. It's, it's a paperback edition. Um, one thing which I also want to mention is that my publisher is a, is a very public spirited uh, publisher. Sure. It's, it's Sinauer. So oh, yes. Sinauer is a, Mass is a Massachusetts right. publisher. Yes. And, <laughs> and so Sinauer uh, just has this attitude that if particularly for small countries like um, the Czech Republic yeah. or developing countries like China, that if they can't afford to pay for the royalties to Sinauer, Sinauer right. just gives them the royalties for free. 
and we just saw that, that there's no transfer of money between countries. So these editions, these foreign language editions, can be sold for very, very inexpensively yeah. in the country so people can afford them. That's a r very great idea. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Okay, anything else on the, that you want to tell us about the, the book part of it, the, the, this? This no, is, I, I just want to underscore that this is a very, very globalist um, kind of approach to publishing these, uh, to textbooks. Now, and you mentioned this is like a rather new field. People have been conservationists for a long time, but you, it, things are developing uh, in a different way. How would young people looking at this field what do they need to know? What kind of training do they get in this case? First of all, they use our fun textbooks here. Mm -hmm. That's but, right. But what kind of training do they need? So many things are interdisciplinary now. Well, I think that's for training. I mean, a lot of this, actually some of the students here tonight mm -hmm. are from Belmont High studying environmental science. Mm -hmm. And this is obviously a good beginning to mm -hmm. sort of learn the science of, of ecology, environmental science, conservation biology. But one of the things which I think is, is so important is that if you want to protect the environment, you have to know the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that, that students really need to really be aware of, that you need to want to be outside mm -hmm. and learn to recognize the trees and the shrubs and the wildflowers. You need to be interested in bird watching. You need to in be interested in, in the insects. You need to know a lot about nature if you want to protect it. It isn't all just sort of book learning and things you mm -hmm. learn in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very important that you do it by yourself. That's actually what Thoreau did. So Thoreau mm -hmm. spent four hours a day, every day, walking around, learning about the environment. So you can take classes, you can go on organized field courses. That's a great way to learn, but learning mm -hmm. on your own is also great. So there's a lot of ways of doing the, this by looking at field guides. We have great field guides for New England and for the United States, field guides to all the different kinds of organisms. And the other thing which is really a great opportunity in New England, which is one of the reasons why New England has so many great naturalists, is that we have so many clubs in the Boston mm. area, which really makes mm -hmm. it easy. So Even butterfly clubs. There's I mean. actually, there actually is even a Massachusetts butterfly club, yes. which has 100 members. There's a Cambridge Entomological Club, mm. the Nuthall Orn Ornithological Club, also lots of bird clubs, plant clubs. Um, Fungus clubs, there's all the clubs you could imagine. <laughs> um, actually, the Fungus Club, you're laughing, but the Fungus Club is extraordinarily active. Actually, we're, we're members of it, and it's a very, very active club. Um, so there are all these clubs where you can learn to recognize these things and go out with like-minded people, um, mm -hmm, often whom mm -hmm. are, who are amateurs, who are just doing it right. as enthusiastic individuals. Right. And so that's really the way to, to learn about the environment. It right. isn't just by reading books. Right. The, the other part of that, it sounds like this is a, a field where a lot of just ordinary people can get involved, can contribute something, can alert you to some kinds of changes that you can't, you can't see everything. But it's a very good citizen science kind of an area, that's too. Right. That's right. Right. So right now we're in kind of a huge development of science where professional scientists are linking up with citizen mm -hmm. science groups or with these kind of... Uh, amateur clubs or very enthusiastic naturalist clubs. So for example, we're working with the, the, the Massachusetts Butterfly Club mm -hmm. and we're analyzing all of their records from the perspective of climate change. And this is great for us because we have access to this enormous data set gathered by a hundred people over the last 30 years. Mm. And they are in turn very enthusiastic about working with, with our group at Boston University because yeah. we're giving a very modern climate change interpretation to a lot of the records yeah. that they've been gathering. Right. So it's really very synergistic. Right. Right. And one more thing, and then I'd like to do, turn it over to the to the audience. In terms of gathering data, you have been talking about like taking notes, basically, which is what we think of with Thoreau and these old farmers that used to note the changes in seasons and so on. But in fact, out there in Concord, you have a very sophisticated system, am I right, uh, with the sky and ground. And I urge people to take a look. I believe there's a little video on your website. Mm -hmm. right. about this uh, but that they you get satellite data and ground data just quickly tell us about this why this very two-way kind of uh, data well the kind of data which we've been gathering from Concord uh, has the great advantage that we really know the species on the ground today mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. they're doing today but in Concord and we also have this historical record going back 150 years. But we don't, what we don't have is the ability to look all across the entire town of Concord because it's, it's 
pretty big. It's about five or six miles across. And also, we don't have this ability to look over larger areas. Mm -hmm. So relating what's happening in Concord mm -hmm. to, what, to what's happening around New England or even around the United States. And it turns out that, that there are people, there are scientists who only have this big perspective. So these are people who, who use satellites to, and remote sensing to determine when plants leaf out in the spring, when, the, when they reach full canopy cover, how much leaf area there is in a forest, and also when those leaves senesce or mm -hmm, die mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in the autumn. And these people who do remote sensing and who often are funded by NASA are incredibly hungry for on the ground truthing <laughs> of what they're doing. So yeah. they, they have all this incredible imagery, but they often don't know what's happening on the ground. Yeah. And so beginning over the, last, over the last two years, I've been linking up with people who do remote sensing work at Boston University. And they have all these different projects, but they, again, they don't have the ground truthing. And so what I propose doing is linking up with mm -hmm. what they're doing with what we're doing mm -hmm. and to basically to provide the validation for each other for our own studies. That makes a lot of sense probably with other kinds of ecosystems as well, back to the tropics and uh, the Arctic region and, and so on. These That would be very, very useful. Maybe it's in place. That's right. It's extremely useful because what we're finding, for example, in the high Arctic that a lot of the Plants are now leafing out earlier, much mm. earlier than the past because of warming conditions, but also because it's warmer. They're also growing a lot more, mm -hmm. and it means they're absorbing more carbon dioxide. So remote sensing is extraordinarily important, particularly at high latitudes, but also in the tropics. But again, what these people in, who are doing, are doing remote sensing, they're sitting in a laboratory, yeah. and <laughs> they're sitting in front of these powerful computers with right. these gigantic... Right. They've never um, seen a leaf. <laughs> but they, they often don't know what the plants look yeah. on the ground. They, they, right. they go there. Sometimes yeah. they go there very briefly just to see, see quickly what's going on. <laughs> right. But people like myself you know, know the plants on the ground, and we can mm -hmm. provide really a very great uh, interaction uh, right. if we can manage to speak the same language. That's one of the challenges. I'm is, sure. Is that the language that we speak is so different from the language <laughs> that, that they speak that you actually have to sit for hours just learning to actually speak the same language. Exactly. That's a very good point, actually, because it's uh, all this interdisciplinary trend across all sciences. It, this is the number one problem, just communicating. It, it, well. also, it also represents a kind of a major trend in science, which is mm -hmm. very different from the humanities, which is that scientists create these collaborative teams very mm -hmm. readily. It's, mm -hmm. it's a feature of modern science mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. if you want to do remote sensing, you often don't learn the techniques of remote sensing, but you bring in a colleague into yeah. your research project. Right and it makes it much easier. I'm going to let, we have high school students with us tonight. I know they're anxious to ask questions and I'd let you have some time with the audience here. I thank you very much. Uh, we'll be recording as much of this as we can, um, but I'd like to turn it over now to questions and answers and thank you very much for joining us thank at you. this time. And me. I'll just sort of withdraw here and let you take questions. That's right. So one example is the highbush blueberry, which is very common. Uh, that was one of Thoreau's favorite plants. And that plant has actually shifted about six weeks earlier mm -hmm. than, um, than it did in Thoreau's time. So that's kind of a, an enormous change. Or marsh marigolds, which is a kind of buttercup which occurs in very wet, swampy areas, has again shifted tremendously. So these, these, are, these are two examples. The species which I'm really talking about, though, are really the species that flower in the spring. So species that flower in the summertime or the very late summer really haven't changed at all. So they're responding much more to day length or precipitation. It's really the species that flower early in the spring that are really responding to temperature. And we particularly like to have questions from high school students. Are we shy? Well, we'll just let the grown-ups do it then. <laughs> is it possible that, it is possible that this has gone on before in, in evolution. And so now we've got people with finite tools and people looking at it, but it is possible that this has happened before and it could be a cycle, is that a true observation or? 
Well, we've had cycles of cooling and warming which have occurred many times over the last two million years. Mm -hmm. But this warming which we're experiencing right now is different from the others because it's happening much more rapidly than warming ever occurred after one of the glass glacial periods. Yeah, so it's happening faster, so it's not clear that species are really going to be able to adapt to it. There's also a lot of roads and power lines and farms and other human, ac human activities which are sort of in the way of species migrating and adapting to the climate change. And also, we have not only warming temperatures, but we also have higher carbon dioxide levels, acid rain, uh, invasive species, a lot of things which are also threatening species at the same time. Yes? Well, I think the, the impacts are, or the thing that you can do is to just think about all the things that you can do to minimize the production of carbon dioxide and, and other greenhouse gases. And again, it involves, for example, walking home rather than you're calling your parents to pick you up or um, uh, turning down the thermostat um, during the winter time, particularly if there's nobody home, but even if there are people at home. So in our home, for example, we keep the temperature between 60 and 62 degrees, and we just put on sweaters, and we sort of get used to it being cool. The only time we turn it above that is when we're having uh, friends of ours over our house who might be too surprised by the cold temperature. <laughs> um, so these are the kinds of things that you can do. Um, you can not buy, buy bottled water. You can just you know, use water from the tap, which is actually better quality than bottled water. You can have a simpler diet, so eat less meat and things like that, which would make you healthier and also result in less production of, of less use of fuel to produce your food. So these are the kinds of things. And the other thing you can do is to um, request the political leaders to address this question and to have a policy in the United States which winds up using less fossil fuels in the United States. I saw an article in Science that suggested that while the ice cover in the Arctic is receding, the ice cover in the Antarctic is increasing. So my question to you is, are the plants and whatnot in the Southern Hemisphere doing exactly what you say you're seeing in the Northern Hemisphere? Are they moving towards the South Pole? Well, there's, there's much less information available from the Southern Hemisphere. So I mean, if you think about the fact of where you have scientific communities, you know, in North America and in Europe, it's a very, very well-developed sort of scientific community. But even, I think, there are studies from, for example, Australia and South Africa showing that plants are now flowering earlier in the spring. Mm -hmm. So even those areas are getting warmer and the plant species are responding. And in regard to the specific study of you know, kind of increased snow cover, ice cover in areas of Antarctic. You can always find one place in the world where things are getting colder or there's more ice cover, uh, but that doesn't take away from what is really a very, very general trend. So if you look across the world, the conditions are getting warmer. Across the world, the average ice cover is getting less, but there's always going to be one place in the world where it's getting colder. And that doesn't to take away from a general trend, it means that there are so many weather stations and there are so many places we can look in the world. So in the United States, I mean, every year there's going to be some place in the United States which gets record cold. But it doesn't mean the United States is getting colder. It just means that in that one particular place it's getting colder, even though most other places are getting warmer. Except that Antarctica is relatively large. It's but a I, large exception. Well, I think that... I have to kind of read the specific study, but I think that study is from one specific place in the Antarctic. It's not from the mm -hmm. whole Antarctic, mm -hmm. it's just from one particular place. Because the shelves are melting. That's right. I think in the general the, the shelves are melting in Antarctica. I think it's so just on. one particular place where right. it's getting larger. Right. And then you contrast that with just the enormous melting of, of ice sheets in the Arctic and in Greenland. Right. We're going to have a Northwest Passage pretty soon. That's right. We're going to get a Northwest Passage. <laughs> a great opportunity to make money. <laughs> Drill for oil. <laughs> I know you mentioned your textbooks and about how some of them have the local, kind of the, from the different countries, the different local attachments or pieces to it. Is there one that has a local or, or a piece to it from Massachusetts, from all the studies that you've done in Massachusetts? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, could you, at what point can you start creating locally adapted editions? And I think that from kind of a, a publisher's perspective, it isn't worth it to do that. So it's, it would be too expensive to create local content. But what I always tell people is I always tell people, you know, don't just read 
my textbook and don't and that's all you should always be combining that with things that you think are interesting so it's your students are interested so if you're in Massachusetts have Massachusetts content or if your students are interested in marine biology you know have have the students read papers from the popular press or from the scientific uh, journals about marine biology so always combine that with something that that makes your course more tailored to the students and the place where you're, you're teaching your course Back. Nope. Yes. Oh, there are just so many places. That's one thing which is so wonderful about Massachusetts. There are many places in the country where you know you just go out of a city and you're immediately in kind of um, farm country that you can't walk around into, or ranch country, or it's, it's too hot. But Massachusetts is great because it because of the collapse of agriculture 150 years ago, you go outside of the city and you just go into forest and lots of public land. But in Belmont, for example, if I was living in Belmont, I would go to this place, I can't remember the name of it, what is it called? Yeah. Rock, Rock Meadow. Meadow. So Rock Meadow, just a short distance from here, is this wonderful kind of place where actually I did research about 20 years ago. Um, also, you go to Mount Arbon Cemetery, which is very close by, which is one of the best places for bird watching in the country. It has this fabulous, uh, density of birds, high density of birds, but you also can see them very close because these you can just walk up on the hills and you're right at treetop for the trees that are planted down in the valleys. So it's a wonderful place to, to look at birds. Um, again, I really love going to Concord because um, in Concord there's just so much public land and there's this kind of interesting mixture of historical buildings and historical places with extensive open areas. So whether you just want to walk to public places or take public transportation or drive or bike there. There's just so much to see here. It's just, it's just inexhaustible um, in the case of, of this region. Have you seen any differences in um, aquatic ecosystems like mm -hmm. fish species? Very good question. Um, it turns out that there's an enormous body of information about when ice out occurs, when, when the ice forms, but particularly when ice out occurs in the spring. Um, in Massachusetts and in New England. And actually there's a group at the U.S. Geological Service that's done an analysis of these data sets. And actually one of the oldest ones is from Ponkapog Bog in the Blue Hills Reservation. But also Thoreau recorded when ice out occurred at Walden Pond. And one of my most famous um, kind of passages, one, one passage of his that I really liked is at one point in the middle of March, he went out to Walden Pond um, in the 1850s and he dug a hole through the ice and he measured the thickness of the ice uh, being 27 inches thick. And if you went out this last um, spring that we just passed and you went out uh, in the middle of March, you would discover that there was actually no ice at all on Walden Pond because oh. we just went through one of the warmest or the mildest winters ever on record. So we don't have very much information about the effects of climate change on the biology of of these habitats, but we have a lot of information on, on ice out time, and ice out times have gotten dramatically earlier. So again, in, in Thoreau's time, ice out occurred um, at the end of March, and now on average, the ice out occurred in the, is in, occurs in the middle of March. So it's a, the ice out is two weeks earlier now at Walden Pond than in Thoreau's time. And this year, ice out occurred at the end of January. It's also freezing quite a bit later, too. That's right, so actually this year, this year Walden Pond froze the first week of January. Mm. So, I mean, just unbelievable. So pond hockey is really in trouble. <laughs> That's right. Actually, one of the things which was very interesting this year was that it became very popular for people to establish these sort of town rinks where people put these, like, boards around and were tending to flood them with water. So <laughs> in, in Newton Center, for example, where I live, right in the town green, they put these boards out <laughs> with the idea of sort of flooding it and creating a little children's skating <laughs> rink in the middle of the, the town commons in Newton Center, but this is true throughout the Boston area, and they never filled it because it never actually got cold enough this year. Ah, oh, it's quite something. Okay. Anything else, people? Questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, please, you can uh, stay and talk with him for a few minutes, and we'll close down here, but thank you so okay. much, Dr. Premack, okay. and we really appreciate you coming. You can just go ahead and talk with people informally.